cool. Um, yeah, thanks. Great to be here, everyone. Great to see so many familiar faces uh, compared to this time last year in Vancouver. Um, so as some of you know, I was the CTO at Jellyfish for about 15 years, and I've uh, recently joined HP under the Advanced Compute Systems Group, where I'll be working on like a lot of the stuff we spoke about today. Um, I really think it's really fantastic. There's been a, like, a lot of emphasis on open standards and USD and how it's going to help better interop and even across pollination between different, um, between if, different industries. So some, some very good talks today. Um, several years ago, basically, um, it's going back probably three years, Paul and I sat down. We really wanted to actually see what does actually USD work like when you actually run it through a live production environment. So we kind of had the, the decision to move like using USD-based assets, you know, from the beginning of the pipeline to the end of the pipeline. And um, we just want to use this time today just to kind of like go over some of the learnings that we've learned. And um, yeah, and there'll be a bit of time for, for some questions and answer after. So without any further ado, um, I'll hand it over to Paul. Um, and also, j just basically, um, just to say also, one of the things that, um, for those of you who don't know, Jellyfish has been doing like a lot of cloud-based stuff over the past little while. So it, uh, even it, it allows Paul's Mac to connect to uh, a proper machine over stuff like Teradici. So it's, um, it's pretty cool from that perspective. So anyway, um, over to Paul, really. Thank you. Thank you. Let's see if this is, if this is better, all the way to the back. Right. So very briefly about Jellyfish Pictures, uh, it's grown a lot recently, which you might have seen in various places. We're now about 600 people globally working primarily out of UK and India, but with some of the work that Jeremy alluded to earlier, the cloud native um, and cloud enabled work that Jellyfish has been based on since 2017, we really work with people anywhere in the world. And it's like, you know, kind of the, the idea that we go where artists and talent are. And, and part of that is that collaboration and what we do is just part of the DNA. Like we, we work with people, we work with studios, we work with clients, we are a software, a, a service provider. So while Jellyfish Originals has a, a, some original and IP work, we mostly do work for feature animation and visual effects. So just some quick examples of what we do. So day-to-day -day life is we have clients on the one side, we have partner studios, we have subcontractors, and they all share data with us, right? So we might do assets and send them to a client studio. They do animation or they do layout. The layout comes back to us. We do animation, produce final images. Um, we might subcontract some of that work to another studio. And, and, and as we do this, and it's not a big surprise, I think, to everyone who has to do this, like creating a frictionless environment is really key because it's, there's nothing quite as a, um, uneventful of having to ingest and export data all the time and getting things right. So that's why we really are excited about what the, the Software Foundation is doing here. And we have fully committed to the 2030 vision. We're fully committed to the, the USD and Material X workflows um, amongst the other standards because that is in, in the place where we are absolutely, uh, we think, the future of how we can actually make this vision work and how we can work together and produce um, great pictures. So. Um, in practice, though, it's always nice to see a Utah teapot rendered in, in different styles, and, and you know, then you go into hit the real world, and, and there's, this, I think, three lenses that we, we looked at at Jellyfish when we started working around Material X and USD. And like, one of the lenses is how ready are the tools? Like, how ready are we really to do this? Um, how compatible are the people? Just because a tool can read a USD file doesn't mean the company is necessarily doing this we're working with. And even if the company is doing it, it doesn't mean you can actually talk about it because I'll hint at that later. There's a lot of nuances in the USD workflows that don't really transfer well when you have to um, go through production channels and, and different levels of knowledge. And so looking at a case study, like how we chose USD and Material X for an interchange on a current animation show. It's 1,000 plus assets traveling across the world on a, on a huge TV show, um, a stylist animation show. So quite a substantial amount of data to transfer and, and package. And that's like the baseline we're at. So Jellyfish, we're doing the assets on this one. We, we are all USD Material X. We're currently rendering in Karma. We're doing um, Solaris. We're using Solaris mostly to author these files. And we produce assets. We ship them to the clients. The clients look at them. The clients like them. Hopefully, they approve them. And we send them these assets. So the goal is we send these assets to partner studios to produce uh, everything to final pixel. So 
the reality now, as we met these partner studios, that the reality there was, yeah, there is it's actually more a Maya pipeline with Arnold. And there's a tiny bit of USD in there, but it's, I made it very tiny to illustrate that it's definitely not um, uh, it's the same. And I think this is just where we are at the moment in our industry. So luckily, in this particular case, we don't have a bi-directional workflow, which would make things much more complicated. So we, at this point, said, OK, let's, let's just go for it. Let's just do it. Let's just, you know, we, I think we're, we're there. We, I think we can, we can really take our tech stack and, and let the artists work in our pipeline so we don't have to make a whole new renderer and, and start with all the new joys of, of Hydra and, and Arnold and all of those things as they're currently in development. Let's just let the artists work in, in Houdini Karma and then we, we somehow magically package it up and it will travel and it comes out the other end and looks the same. So what could go wrong? I don't know, what, what could possibly go wrong? So looking at those three lenses again, Material X, I think, as a baseline, it, it works, which is, is it's awesome. We love it, but just kind of. You know, as we started using it, we started to see that, yeah, it's a nice convention, but it's used differently, so differently enough that it doesn't really hold up to the promise just yet. Um, we found quite a few gaps in lighting and render settings, so that certain lights and render settings, they don't transport as well as they could or maybe should or would be one day. Um, and we also realized that working with different DCCs that all are at different levels of support, it just creates a whole new undercurrent of, of how we work, of, of, you know, suddenly you have to update tools all the time to get the latest USD support, to get the latest Material X support. So um, I'll get to this in a second, but certain things like the reference platform become a little bit moot in, in a way that we can't rely on this. We have to actually commit to the latest versions if we want to leverage this. Um, we also learned that some of the customization we're very proud of, they doesn't transfer very well. It's like, uh, you know, it's like amazing all these things we can do in USD that help us internally. But when you go to a client and go, or a partner do that they and say, please cast a red car in your shot, that's very easy to say. But internally, what we really do is we inherit a material library through a different variant and then specialize a primvar it, it, it doesn't, you know, how does it coordinate to talk to a studio across the other side of the world? You want to say, take the red car and transport it across. Um, we had more challenges around different tech stacks and, and you know, communication. But we, we still said, you know what, we, we can make this work um, and, and started taking several initiatives. And the first one there was really we, we started reaching out to, to Fred and the, the amazing Arnold team and, and started approaching them and said, look, we have we've been doing this. And the first response was, I think you guys are a little bit crazy. And we were like, yes, I think we are, but the show is not that, that complicated look-wise. And you know, we, we agreed we can do this, and, and I think it's, it's doable. And it's been an amazing support. So thank you at this point to Adrian and Fred at Autodesk. Um, we also embrace current limitations. We worked with production and said, look, we cannot share lights at this point and expect them to show up on the other end. So we agreed that we would do lighting, more like reference work. So we would render turntables and stills and would say, that's how it should look like and we can tell you where these lights are, but we don't expect you to put the same lights into your, um, into your pipeline and get the same results. So you have to then visually recreate them. Um, we put way more sanity checks in place than I thought we would have to do. Uh, and we, uh, on the USD level, we introduced a new concept, a new entity that we called production variants, where we started actually slimming down the complexity of our USD files into a simpler package because we realized that these nested ones um, just don't quite work when you have to work across time zones and, and places. And we also committed quite early to the latest versions of, of everything. So we just told our partners up front, it's like, if you, if you do this, then uh, be prepared that you'll install Arnold a lot. And we all agreed that this is a, a place, and Maya, USD, et cetera, that we would do this a lot, that we would change our pipelines quite quickly as releases came out. And um, with that agreement, we, we started. It was a lot of uh, communication in the end, though. Like, it was definitely, maybe we still are in it, to be honest. Um, but. Yeah, diving a little bit into two of these examples. Um, one is the production variance and one is the material X uh, example. So what we understand as production variance is a simplified packaged version of an asset that I, I looked briefly whether we should maybe show you a graph of how we do this in USD and then I, I thought I'd just copy paste a lot of USD logos because that's kind of how a, a USD asset looks like in some ways, right? There's like all these interdependencies and um, pointers and, and it just, you know, all these 
amazingly powerful composition arcs, but um, what we decide is okay, we, we, we break this down and every representation of an asset, we just bake it into a discrete uh, package. Um, so the benefits of this is that these packages are very easy to talk about. You can say, here's the red car, here's the blue car, here's the green car. Um, you have version one or you have version six. So very straightforward to talk about it. Um, the, the second benefit is it can just be read in an Arnold stand-in and it renders. So if you want to do instancing, you can just put it in and it works out of the box and that, that's, you know, nice. Um, or you can unpack it and this is like, we've, this is where with the workflow we went for, it's like we don't want to dictate the pipeline to a vendor studio. So it's now their choice to, or we can empower them to go read it as a stand-in and render it as it is. Or maybe translate USD to Maya data, take the Material X file and apply it in Arnold, et cetera. So these doors open and we're now coming up with actually quite nice hybrid workflows of how all this weaves together. And so a brief example of the production variant. Uh, also, thank you for the ontology of uh, the 2030 vision. I, I love having this now available in terms of just a little uh, graphing. But you know, nothing too magical really with this, but it, one thing we definitely learned as part of this is we, we're not going from our USD file. It, it sounds universal, has universal name, but practically there's a universal and there's a less universal version of the whole thing. Well, our version is actually less universal with all the custom stuff. So we had to re-universalize it again um, in the production variant world to package it and um, ship it to the partner studios and, and collaboratively worked on the package and ingest scripts to find this new common ground for around USD. So you know, with production variants in place, it should just work uh, if it wouldn't have been for some of the, some of the uh, material X issues. And this is where, you know, as I said earlier, the, our asset team and the pipeline teams and the Arnold team really collaborated super well, um, where we went through every single material X node, uh, rendered them in Houdini and Karma, uh, then rendered everything in Arnold and Maya and made this you know, big confluence pages comparing how these different things render, made abstract cases like here, I think the key ones for us were the triplanar and some of the UDIM issues. So on the left you can see what it should look, on the right you can see what it looked like. And then with that we had a very uh, long Slack threads with Adrian um, until late to solve them one by one and they got resolved. So that they looked actually the same in both our applications. So with that, I wish I could show you at this point like this amazing render now where we switch from this beautiful big world to the other beautiful big world and it looks the same. Um, it's a live show, so I, I can only show you a humble test pumpkin, um, which, is, which is this one here. Um, next time, it's one of those debates, right? Every time you come here, you can either show the latest and greatest and you can't show the final production images or I can come next year and show you the images, um, but then it's a year too late maybe uh, to share some of this. So I, I think the main point I wanted to make though is we are now at a place where the artists work in, in our pipeline that we currently have chosen around Solaris and Karma and USC Material X. Um, but they can, once it goes into a, a very simple packaging step, um, or you know, technically packaging step, it takes it out and an artist can very interactively just flip between renderers. And this is now part of the daily production workflow that you just quite literally click Arnold, comma, Arnold, comma, and, and can see where these things are at. And we have built now these sanity checks because on the list of nodes that we know are not supported, we know that certain things we're just not doing anymore at this point, but excited that as new versions come along, it just works. So what did we learn? I think um, we learned, we, we made it work. We, we started with the open standards. We, it was a, a great step forward for us to, to, to build, and we want to build it out further. But the translation and simplification is still needed. And, and for myself, it was definitely a, in, in some ways humbling to see how much time we had to spend to test, to communicate, to patch and fix issues. That um, there was maybe a bit of a naive view initially to walk into this and go like, oh, we're using these open standards. Surely this just transports really well. Um, but we had to actually spend quite a bit of time to, to reduce complexity and, and solve, solve problems on a, on a DCC level. And we as an industry, we're very much in a time of transitioning and learning. And I think the devil is in the details. It's big brushes. I think big brushes are solved. Really exciting. It's exciting what, what has been presented so far, really, and seeing what's coming. But you know, there's like often these little nodes that then break that, that really can stop you from delivering a shot. Um, but we also learned that we can embrace limitations. We worked really well with the production teams to go, okay, certain production expectations were amended to, to work with the situation. Um, we also learned that 
while we started out and we want to be in a place where we all can work in our pipelines and have these, these great initiatives in the middle to share data, I think at this point in time we are more dependent on certain software updates than less. Um, if we wouldn't have updated to some of the latest releases, we just couldn't have done or we couldn't be doing this work right now. Um, and you know, having excellent collaboration with side effects and Autodesk were absolutely key to, to get these things forward. And another thing, which I mean, I've been a bit of an USD evangelist for, for a while, and I, I loved, have been, loved using it for the last several years, but I think in some ways it was very humbling to kind of go back and go, okay, all these cool things and all these amazing features that it provides and you can finally do, they can really be an obstacle once you start working, once you have to take things back again. Um, and I think this is where I'm quite excited about the next years of hopefully where the general bar rises up and, and standards come along and, and more processes come along that help us with all of this so we can go back into leveraging this. And this is for me like some outlook and recommendations for, for us to this room. Like, love the common, so I'd love to support, or I'm supporting very much like looking into some common workflow standards because I think there's so many flavors of USD out there now that it's, it's you know, now there's a jellyfish USD asset currently floating around the studio's use. There's obviously the Animal Logic uh, Kitchen Lab. They have a structure, they have a structure. And it, you may not, I feel like, at a place right now where we can actually use it to interchange it as fluidly as we should be. And these are often quite trivial assets, if you really think about it. Like, it's a hard-surfaced asset with a texture and a relatively simple material. We're not at a place where we all have agreed that this is how we package it. This is a structure that works for us. This is the intention of this asset, so how we ship it around, especially with if there's an expectation, not just for final consumption, but to do something with it. It's, it's not that hard, I think, to make a self-contained USD asset and, and have it render somewhere else. But the moment you have to unpack it and grab parts of it, I think there's a lot of uh, ambiguity around this. Uh, the, Certain parts of shared central asset management, very excited to hear about, hear more interested about what asset.io can help in this area. Um, there are certain dependencies or, or, or life cycle choices you have to make in production where you want to have a material library centrally, for example, that all the assets inherit from. But if you've worked now over years with another studio and your library changes in a different rhythm than your assets do, you, you they only the assets might then look wrong if they haven't been updated to the library. And because it's another studio, you can't really control how they have managed their asset resolvers, right? So there's cu I'm very curious to look into how central asset management on certain parts will look like in the future to go, how do we share dependencies or how do we share certain relationships where we say, these assets looked good yesterday. No, you don't have to update them if you have done this because then you get the latest uh, materials referenced in. Um, also looking forward to the new standards like OpenPBR. It's very exciting to see how we can use that to, to open more doors. And um, in the next projects, we definitely will look a bit more into the balance of, you know, how we, we, we're leaning out of the window very far, I think, to the to the point where, where then Autodesk pulled us back on a, on a string and uh, made, made it work again. Um, but we definitely, that paradigm of we have to use the latest version, which brings or can bring a lot of stress to, to the wider production, um, which was, yeah, exciting in the spirit of innovation, but in, in the production reality, um, also quite quite stressful. Uh, and versus, you know, certain reference platform stability, and you know, treading that line carefully with, you know, how new are we, how robust are we, um, and, and pushing things forward on those lines. So, very excited to keep keep pushing on those areas. And, and with that, I want to extend the big thanks to to some of the people without which this wouldn't have been possible. Um, Rich, Dan, uh, CG supervisors, Hannah, Izzy, Mark. Mr. the pipeline team, and then again, thanks again, Adrian Frederick at, at Autodesk uh, for the last weeks and months of collaboration. And with that, I say thank you very much. And we have a couple minutes for questions. Thanks. Um, could you go into a little bit more detail about um, the sorts of things that break when you're trying to share USD with like, um, other vendors and look, yeah, um, like some examples, perhaps. So you, you're talking more about the what breaks when you share a, a USD file entirely? Or, so I think one is the, the levels of inheritance or the different files we were using and asset, you know, when you point to the latest version or if your system resolves to the latest approved, if the moment you share that, you have to, at this point, fetch whatever that was and package it together. Um, but at that point, you 
you lose the ability then to just keep updating that one version. So I think you know breaking these resolutions was one issue. Um, we had smaller level problems translating from Windows to Linux, for example, how the cases worked internally. Um, we had challenges around um, some of the nodes within Material X, like certain you know fetching, like side effects adopted certain nodes or created certain nodes to fetch primvars or UVs that were not supported at the time in, in Arnold. Um, so these, I think, cases. But then there's a workflow, as I said earlier. The workflow is just the hard part around, which is very solvable, right? There's no technical limitation, but using inheritance and specialized arcs can go real or, or deep variant nesting makes it just impossible to talk on a call. Like if you need to tell a coordinator, you know, our team is trained, they know what to do, but the other team has no idea like what happens under the hood. So we really learned that we that it's not a technical limitation, but more like a workflow limitation or a shared training. And I think this is where we and this group can actually do a lot of work to, to create baselines of understanding. So when we say, you know, you swap from here to here, everyone knows this as part of some sort of canonical knowledge potentially. Thank you. Hi, thank you. That was thank really you. interesting. I had a question about Kind of bigger asset build. So what you were saying, okay, applies to assets, characters, hard surface, cars, whatever, vehicles. Did you do the same packaging in environments, for example, that you would do some kind of set dressing and suddenly you have to reference help your AR resolvers trying right. to get there? How did you deal with it? Or was it, here's assets, no, build no, this environment? That's a good one. I, I had some slides on this too, but I thought it would get uh, too big of a presentation. So when it came to assemblies and USD assemblies, we went for a... Um, a, a flattening approach where we basically created Maya files with locators for every instance of a component. So we at this point flattened any nested assembly structure. Let's say you know you had your, your chair, all the chairs, and then the group of chairs, and then the room and the hotel and Los Angeles. We would then just take Los Angeles, resolve it down to the component level, put a locator in place that had a that translated the asset info of that component back into some. A, a Maya attribute, which then allowed the other studios to pass this and basically reconstruct it. So they would lose the assembly history in a sense, but they would at least know that final set dressing, you know, this microphone was slightly rotated and they could then instance, or they can instance this based on their own logic and whatever. So um, we did share it and we went through the Maya data model for that, uh, long story short. Right, so, so you were actually set dresses, you were sending us Maya scenes rather than USD scenes with these attributes and then yeah. recreate Maya scene from that. It, yes. Maya I, think, I think it's a separate talk because it's actually a really good topic. Um, we, we would love to get to a place where we can extract certain opinions um, more clearly because that's kind of what USD on paper allows you and allows us to do it internally. But the moment you share thing, again, we're ending up in this dependency hell of that these overrides only apply to these versions and how do you track this? And so at this point, we just went for a, um, here's a bunch of matrices with attributes, good luck. And you know, we made a JSON file, we made a, we made a Maya file, and either way would just describe where things are at and then would be on the, on the vendor side, or the client or partner side would be passed and interpreted and reconstructed. And they then had their own lo logic to re-instance uh, and to compare and see what's different, et cetera. Thank you. Hey there. Just sort of following up on that question, that that decision to go to a, a Maya file with locators was that kind of for the vendors, like because you wanted to go for a, a kind of the simplest possible, you know, structure that they could reconstruct, or was it because you could you could always create like a flattened USD structure right. that did the same thing, right? But I guess maybe you wanted to kind of give them the flexibility. I think it, it was a, yeah, it was a somewhat pragmatic choice because I didn't go into this example so much. We also did layout actually, or we are still doing layout on this show. So there were also performance caches and we went Maya anyways. So we had Maya rigs um, moving around. And so at this point when we started packaging the, the Maya scenes with the rigs, we just realized, okay, the USD stage is referenced. At this point, we just, as we package it anyways, we just package the entire thing, thing and ship it rather than um, making another USD station has to be referenced back in. So I think if it would have been a pure asset level sharing, if the vendor would be doing layout, we 
probably would have gone more for USD approach, but because we shared our Maya scenes for layout with Maya data and rigs, um, at that point we just packaged everything in one go because that was simpler for the vendor to pass and ingest. Do we have time for one more question? That was one at the back as well. I got um, pretty excited when you said that you're excited about these common workflow standards needed for USD asset structures. Right. Um, do you see that happening uh, in the near future, or is there is there a forum or a, or a resource that where it's already happening? Because we're working on moving to USD, and that would be like invaluable. Yeah, I, I think. I mean, this is it's a bit for this room. I know that I've talked to a few people so far. Um, uh, like Paolo and, and people like where we talked about it's like coming up with a certain amount of intent or so like even some basic ideas of that we could agree on I, I maybe we'll take this to Alex and the, the, the working group to to bring it back I think there's there's definitely room there and I think even to agree on what some of the intents could be at first would be nice to go this is like a hard surface asset or this is a one with and I think I know NVIDIA is proposing more in the effects world, et cetera. So I think there's a, a spectrum. Maybe we don't have to solve everything, but I'd love to just go, if we have to send a, another rock across the globe, I'd love to just build it in a way that different studios know and there are resources for them to learn it. And it's not like um, us individually spending a lot of time packaging documentation, et cetera, up. It, in my opinion, it should just uh, bring some of the U back into USD that not only is a file format, but there's actually workflows. And it's very hard to be wrong with USD, right? It's very, everyone can do something pretty cool with it. But the moment you have to start working together, we're back at not quite square one, but um, there may be room to, to agree on certain bits with then abilities for studios to layer their idiosyncrasies on top. So I say working group, I hope. Okay, I think this was the last question. Hi, uh, maybe I missed it in the beginning, but in terms of Material X, is that something you already get from the clients or is there some translation that you have to do? No, we're building it ourselves. We just, um, when we went all USD a couple of years ago, we, we just at that point also just went for Material X and, and Karma at that point because we were, um, so, so much is happening. We decided we want to keep things with in, in, a, in a small software dependency, software stack in a sense. Like we, the goal, the dream is we can use any renderer and any tool that we want. But at, at that point, we were like, okay, if we author things in Solaris, it makes sense to also stick with Karma. And that means Material X became a bit like a logical consequence of that. And we, um, we're working towards a, an open framework, so we can work with any vendor and any renderer that we like. That's the, that's the dream. Uh, right now, this was just uh, where we are. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much to thank Paul you. and to Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs>